Our first speaker is uh, Marlene Geronimi, and she will talk about can Aratex exclude an irrelevant vibrissal stimulus but attend to the relevant stimulus, psychophysics, and modeling. Can you hear me? No. Ah, perché l'ho spento. Si sente? Così? Oh. Can you hear me? Yeah. Ok. Ok, so good afternoon. I'm Marlene Geronimi. Today I will present my master thesis project called Can I write exclude any relevant vibrissal stimulus but attend uh, to the relevant one in psychophysics and modeling? So before um, going with the details of the experiment, I'd like to give a brief introduction about the topic. We know that the ability to focus on relevant information and to exclude irrelevant information is an important ability that can be mentioned among the executive functions. So those functions that allow flexible behavioral adaptation and goal-oriented behavior. And I will give you two examples. The first is this. Many times I had to focus on what was written on my textbook if I wanted to pass the exam, but I also had to ignore the constant meowing of my cat because it's very clingy. And the second is this. So imagine being at the bar with your friend and the place is very loud. So if you want to hear what your friend is saying, you will need to focus on his voice and to filter out the noise coming from the environment. These functions have been widely investigated in humans, especially in the visual spatial domain. Nevertheless, here we want to know whether rats can learn to ignore an irrelevant tactile stimulus and whether this irrelevant stimulus can impact a perceptual judgment made on the relevant one. Why rats? These animals are highly intelligent, and with them we can achieve a level of resolution not possible with humans. And we want to focus on the tactile modality because in this respect, it has been poorly investigated. So we want to answer our questions by using behavioral training and analysis. Here we'll talk about behavioral results. We are using quantitative modeling. We want to build a model that can efficiently explain the rat's behavior. And we are also performing electrophysiology, collecting neuronal data from primary vibrissal motor cortex. But this is a work in progress. So concerning the design, this is our setup. Our rats are freely moving and self-paced, and they are put in this plexiglass chamber. And when they want to initiate a trial, they will enter this nose spoke with the snout. A sensor detects the presence of the snout, and the vibrotactile stimulus is delivered via this plate onto the whiskers of the rat. When the trial is finished, the rat can go either to the right side of the chamber to make a response, or to the left side of the chamber. In this case, he is correct, so he receives water as a reward. Concerning the task, well, we developed the relevant stimulus paradigm. Quite complicated. So we have a pre-stimulus delay, followed by the onset of the do not process stimulus, DNP, which is the relevant one, followed by an interstimulus interval that can range from 500 milliseconds to 3,000 milliseconds. Overlapping, we have this acoustic cue that signals the onset of the PP stimulus, please process, which is the relevant one. We have a post-stimulus delay and a go cue is played. At this point, the red must decide whether the PP stimulus was a strong or weak according to a reference value that he has internalized throughout the training session. However, on some trials, we only have the PP stimulus alone because we want to have a control of the performance. Concerning the stimuli, we use vibrotactile stimuli to differ in their intensity. And by intensity, I mean the mean speed of the vibration. So we use nine intensities for the relevant stimulus combined with the five intensities of the relevant one highlighted by the squares. There's a stimulus where the dashed line is the boundary, so the reference value stimulus. So, talking about the results, here we have the overall performance of this rat, KR2. I will present data of this rat, but we are also analyzing uh, behavioral data from other four rats. So this is a psychometric curve that tells us about performance. How do I compute this? I calculate the proportion of answers strong per each PP intensity, and then if 
fit the curve using the cumulative Gaussian function, and you can see the equation. So this function has four parameters. Mu represents the inflection point. Changes in mu can signal a bias in the performance. Sigma is inversely related to the slope and is a proxy for the sensitivity of the subject. Gamma and lambda are respectively the lower and the upper lapses rate and capture those situations in which the rat was distracted or guessing. So if you look at the plot, on the x-axis we have the PP intensities, on the y-axis the probability of answering strong. The blue curve represents all trials put together, those with both DNP and PP, and um, trials with only the PP stimulus. The purple line represents only the trials with the PP stimulus alone. We see that the rat is performing quite well, the curve is quite steep, there are a few lapses, so the rat understood the task. So now we want to see the impact of the relevant stimulus. So here we see the effect of the relevant stimulus by these psychometric curves that has been divided by jump intensity. And we see that the relevant stimulus exerts an attractive effect on the choice made upon the relevant one, meaning that if the DMP was weak, there is an increased likelihood of judging the PP as weak. And if the DNP was strong, there is an increased likelihood of judging the PP as strong. Nevertheless, as you notice here, we have an asymmetry in this data because weak PP intensities are more impacted by the presence of the DNP. This could happen because weak stimuli engage fewer neurons in their encoding, and so the representation is more unstable. Here we have all the training sessions put together. But we also wanted to look at how performance changes as training goes on. So here I was able to identify a well-trained stage and an expert stage. During the well-trained stage, you clearly see the distance between the curves. Clearly, the relevant stimulus is exerting an effect. But during the expert stage, all the curves are overlapping. And this means that the rat is truly ignoring the relevant stimulus and basing his decision only upon the relevant one. We know this is a central process going on in the brain because we have a camera connected to the chamber and we look at the rats while they are performing the task. And we know the rat is receiving the vibration of the relevant stimulus. So he is perceiving the relevant stimulus and he is ignoring it as well. Using variable RSI durations, we also looked at time-dependent effects. On the left, you see uh, the effect of the RSI duration when the DNP is weak. On the right, when the DNP is strong we see from the blue curve that the short ISI duration enhances the attractive effect of the relevant stimulus, especially when it is strong. This could happen because during the ISI, a memory trace of the relevant stimulus is formed. And this memory trace decays as the ISI increases. So when this interval is short, um, the memory trace is still very strong. So previous findings from our lab tell us that the history of past stimuli exert an effect on the current decision, we looked at this effect for the well-trained stage and the expert stage. During the well-trained stage, we see that the previous PP stimulus exerts a repulsive effect on the current choice. So if the previous PP was weak, the current one will be more likely judged as a strong. This effect disappears in the expert stage. Probably, in the expert stage, the onset and subsequent ignoring of the DMP clears out the history register. Learning to ignore the relevant stimulus also means learning to ignore the previous trial. But in the world trend stage, somehow acting upon and attending to the DMP does not clear out the register, and the effects are dragged onto the next trial. So to try to make sense of all of this, we conceptualize two possible models consistent with two strategies that the rats might be using, attention or selection and response inhibition. Here we have the model consistent with attention or selection. So during the world trend stage, the rat loads the DMP in a short-term buffer called decision variable on the vast majority of the trials. Since this variable is already occupied by the relevant stimulus, the PP cannot be loaded. The decision will be based only upon the DMP explaining the effect. But during the expert stage, the rat learns that the acoustic cue signals the onset of the relevant stimulus, and on the vast majority of the trials, he will load only the PP stimulus. And we explain the absence of DMP effect. Then we have this model that is consistent with inhibiting some sort of response. During the world trend stage, the DMP is loaded in a decision variable, a memory trace is formed. This memory trace during the ISI is attracted towards the choice that what would have made on the DMP. So 
So when the PP is loaded in the decision variable, it will dynamically interact with the memory chase, and the choice on the PP will be attracted towards the potential choice on the DMP. But during the expert stage, things change because the DMP is loaded in the decision variable, but the memory trace immediately fades away by attraction towards a neutral state, so a neutral choice. When the PP is loaded, the decision variable is empty, and so the choice will be based only upon the relevant stimulus. So concerning the world train stage, uh, oh, sorry, here we have response inhibition because the rat either succeeds or fails in inhibiting the proper formation of the memory trace. So uh, for the world train stage, based on the results of the ISI and the history effect, the model that could be more consistent with the data is uh, this response inhibition model. But for the expert stage, the rat could have mastered both strategies, so both models could be working. So our next steps will be to <coughs> continue collecting neuronal data from VM1, but we want also to add the secondary vibrissal motor cortex or frontal cortex. These are areas involved in decision making. And we also want to record from posterior parietal cortex. It is an associative area also involved in uh, attentional processes. Then we want to understand which strategies and how these strategies are implemented by the rats, tensional selection or response inhibition by using the neuronal data we are collecting and by using also computational modeling. So if we can understand what the rats are doing, what happened in the brains of these rats, the results could be useful for those situations in humans in which learning to focus on what is important and discarding what is not important is not properly implemented such as in neurodevelopmental conditions like ADHD, autism disorder, and uh, also schizophrenia. So I am done. I would like to thank the Tactile Perception and Learning Lab at CISA, my supervisor, Matthew Diamond, and I would like to thank Kwang Gil, with whom I've been conducting the experiment together. Thank you. Really interesting talk. So time for questions from the audience. Hi. Um, thank you for this interesting talk. Um, which kind of recording would you like to uh, do? Like. Uh, an analysis, what do you expect to find in the brain, like what we are looking for? Sorry. Mm, like for the next steps, you okay. speak about uh, recording in different mm -hmm. areas and uh, possible link with the behavior. So which kind of um, data or um, information are you looking for to be able to connect with this behavior? Well, we want to record like uh, neuronal data from these areas because one of the analysis that we want to do is to be able to understand at which point during the information processing pipeline the two stimuli diverge in their importance and one idea that we had was to somehow employ representational similarity analysis to try to see at which point the two stimuli uh, diverge is ah no 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 we are using like uh, arrays of electrodes yes extracellular recordings Any others? Okay, if not, thank you again, Marlene. Thank you. So the next speaker is Carlos Daniel Corrales Parada, and uh, he, his presentation is titled Sensory Cues for Social Recognition.
today I would like to tell the beginning of a story about sensory cues for social recognition. And as we can see from this picture, we have uh, the images of different animal species. And this is to point out how different animals use different, uh, use uh, preferred uh, sensory cues in the recognition of one specifics. So for example, the peacock spider uh, might use uh, visual cues for the recognition of potential sexual partners. And the same is true for rats in which also these visual cues are used uh, for the identification of uh, competitors and potential cooperators. But of course there are also uh, other animal species that, uh, for example, vocalize. And for these species, uh, for example, the howler monkey or Synodontis grandiops, which is a species of catfish, uh, sound cues might be very important in the recognition of one specifics. Uh, but we have different uh, social communication systems, and one example of this is the elephant nose fish, uh, which has an electric organ, so he's able to produce electric organ discharges, and these electric organ discharges uh, are used by them uh, to recognize conspecifics uh, from heterospecifics, and also to identify uh, potential sexual mates. So, as I just said before, there have been different studies conducted about recognition in different animal species, which range from invertebrates to vertebrates. Are, these are other uh, animal species that have been tested. And we have also different levels of recognition, which, uh, which are depicted here close to the vertical line. And different levels of range from face-like configuration recognition to the most complex form of recognition, which is individual uh, recognition, which is the ability to recognize familiar conspecifics as different one from the other. We also have in this picture different colors. So in red, we have the species that can recognize different familiar conspecifics uh, as different one from the other. In, in blue, we have the species that have been tested to recognize different humans by the presentation of different human faces. And in green, we have the species that can recognize different familiar conspecifics, but also have been tested to recognize different human faces, uh, different humans by the presentation of human faces. But now, we will focus on fish uh, and to try to understand uh, what is known about them. So, we know from the previous picture that they have the most complex form of recognition, so they have individual recognition, and this is the case, for example, in cichlids, uh, which can recognize different uh, familiar conspecifics, uh, more specifically, males can recognize different rivals to be different one from the other in an aggressive context. And the same is true for three spines stickleback, which have individual recognition in a territorial context. So also they can recognize different rivals. Uh, uh, but do sensory cues for recognition differ between uh, closely related species or species that are closely related and maybe have a different social communication system? Well, uh, first of all, we have to say that there is a lack of direct comparisons in recognition abilities between members of the same family. And another important aspect is what, what is uh, a good family of fishes to try to answer this question. Uh, so what could be a good uh, family of fish uh, that uh, can tackle uh, this, uh, this question here? And here is uh, where I think that my animal uh, model species uh, came into account because uh, with I study Cynodontis catfish which is a, you know, it's a family of catfish uh, that's able to produce different uh, sensory uh, cues uh, that potentially they use um, for communication between conspecifics and for the recognition of them. So in Synodontis catfish, we have a muscle that uh, contracting uh, produce uh, vocalizations, and vocalizations are a very well established uh, social communication system in some fish species. Uh, but in, uh, this is the case, for example, in Synodontis grandiops and Synodontis eupterus. But in some synodontous species, this, uh, this protracted muscle has, uh, has been converted into an electric organ. So they uh, produce electric organ discharges. And this is the case for synodontous nigriventis and synodontous eupterus, which ha have an intermediate muscle. And so it's able to produce both vocalizations, but also electric discharges. And yes, this fish is not dead. It's just uh, an upside down catfish, so this wing upside down. Uh, and here in the right, we have uh, different pictures. Uh, so the first one is uh, Grandios, the second one is Eupterus, and the third one is Nigriventris. And in the first part, we have a schematization of the location of the system that allows them to produce the vocalizations and the electric discharges. And in the uh, part here, more to the, to the middle, we have a dorsal and a lateral view of the protractor muscle, and we can see that uh, the, the, the answer form of the muscle and the derived uh, uh, protractor muscle, which is uh, able to produce electric discharges, has, uh, 
it has been elongated uh, to be able to build these uh, electric discharges. More uh, to the left, we have uh, the Mullerian Ramos, which is this small uh, bone here, that in the fish that can produce vocalizations bump into this wind bladder, allowing them to produce uh, these uh, tonal and pulsed sounds. And we can see that in the species that are able only to produce electric discharges, there is a reduction in the size of this bone. Um, finally, in, the, in this uh, part here, we have sections of the protractor muscle, so this one here, and we can see that uh, the, the electric fish uh, have a reduction in the number of myofibers. So in this picture, we have seen that there are different uh, differences between the two species, and they also can produce different signals. So uh, they of this uh, family of catfish offer a unique opportunity to study closely related species that have uh, different, uh, that produce different sensory cues, uh, and that might use these cues uh, for social recognition. Uh, so some of them, as I just said, produce between bladder tonal and pulse and sounds, and this is the case for eupterus and grandios. And here we have two examples. Now I will play the eupterus vocalizations. And uh, the grandus one. Uh, so they are slightly different. And uh, the other fishes, uh, other uh, synodontid fishes produce uh, weekly electric discharges. Again, this is the case for uh, eupterus and also for nigriventris. But the question was then are the signals alone sufficient to enable them to recognize some specifics? And uh, before answering this question, I have to answer a more simple one, uh, which is can they recognize some specifics? So to answer this question, I, uh, I tested my fish in this experimental setup in which I divided an aquarium in three different compartments, one in which I place uh, a conspecific, one in which I place a heterospecific, and the center one in which I place my focal fish of the three species. Then I divided this central compartment in four different sectors, and I um, recorded the behavior of my fish inside this apparatus for uh, one hour, and uh, uh, measured the distance the fish moved inside the center here, and also the time they spent in the different sectors. And I use this time, uh, especially those in the, in the borders, to calculate a preference score, uh, so that I will be able to uh, try to understand if they have species-specific recognition. Well, what I found, I found that there is a, preference, uh, a significant preference score uh, for uh, a preference for conspecifics in eupterus and grandios, uh, and there is a high trend of significance for a preference for conspecifics in Igreventris. And the only reason we believe that they, they do not have the, the significant uh, preference for uh, on specifics is because there was one fish that during the test, for some reason that we don't understand, uh, very hated his on specific. Uh, but still, we do believe that three species have uh, a species specific recognition because there is no uh, significant difference between the three means. Uh, as I just said, we also measure the distance the, 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 the three different species move inside the arena to try to understand if they have a different exploratory approach to the apparatus. And we found, yes, that there is a different uh, exploratory behavior in the species. And we have a significant difference in exploratory behavior between eupterus and nigriventris for the distance moved in the apparatus, and a, and a trend of significant uh, exploratory behavior between eupterus and grandios. So, uh, let's summarize what I found. And uh, I can say, uh, first of all, uh, that uh, grandios, eupterus, and nigriventris have the ability to, uh, of uh, species-specific recognition, so they recognize their conspecifics. And this is uh, by the displayed social preference to work on specifics. But also, that there, was a, there, were, there were differences uh, between eupterus uh, and nigriventris for the exploratory behavior of the experimental setup. And there was a trend. Uh, for a difference in the exploratory behavior also between eupterus and grandios. So now that I have uh, answered this first uh, simple question, I can move uh, to the one I did at the beginning. Are these sensory cues, uh, in, depending on the uh, social communication system, uh, alone enough to allow them to recognize their conspecifics? And to do this, I assigned three different experiments, which now I am currently working in. And the first one is to try to understand if in the absence of olfactory cues, there is still species-specific recognition in the three species. And this, this is because uh, catfish has a, has a very well de uh, developed uh, sense of olfaction. But then I will test uh, my electric species in a setup in which I, I will expose them 
to electric discharges, social electric discharges, in comparison to white noise electric discharges. And for those, uh, for mine species that are in, in the, instead uh, able to vocalize, I will test uh, them with uh, social sounds and non-social sounds. And in the species, so eupterus, that can produce both types of signals, I will test uh, them in the two apparatuses and try to understand if they use these signals to recognize their conspecifics. Uh, I'm also uh, looking into their brain uh, to try to understand if this switch in, in social communication system was also translated in changes in their connectivity. So I'm tracing the electrosensory and acoustic system in the three, in, in the three species. I'm also tracing the uh, vocal producing system and the electric producing system. Uh, we're also looking if, if this change in social communication system has also translated in changes in the neurochemistry. So for example, if there is uh, a different uh, expression of uh, calcium binding proteins by uh, immunohistochemistry, and also if there are changes in the functional activation by using PS6 as a marker of neural activity in my fish exposed to social and non-social signals, if they have a different communication system. So the electric ones and the vocalizing ones. Uh, so now I would like to thank uh, my two supervisors for all the help, help and suggestions they, they have given me so far. The other members of my lab in, in Graz, uh, the postdoc, uh, Torin Johnson, for uh, all the useful insights for the tracking of the fish. And of course, my experimental subjects, because without them, this project could have not been possible. And now I also would like to thank you for your attention. So questions? So how do you know whether the sounds and the electric charges are uh, hostile sounds and charges or friendly signals? Actually, there is no evidence in how they use this or how, what message they convey in, in, in this, in, with the, by the production of these uh, signals because, because they have been recorded just by putting a link in a hydrophone or electrons inside the aquarium with one fish alone, a bunch of fish together, or uh, with by having the fish in the hand. That's why I would like to do this experiment, because I think that the, uh, uh, the recognition of specifics by uh, just the presentation of, of uh, 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 basic tonal sound or the, um, the most simple sound, uh, form of electric discharge may be enough uh, to allow them to recognize them or to be deterred by these signals. So we will test again uh, the three species to see whether or not they get closer or if they get farther apart. That's the idea. Yeah, yeah. OK, thanks. Hi. Um, premise, I'm not a fish person. I don't study fish, so I might be missing something. But um, my understanding is that your three-chamber test measure the time spent like, with one or the other fish there. And I understand your results say that most, they spend more time with their co-specific. Is it really correct to say that they recognize their co-specific? Because imagine if they were spending more time with the other. Can't you just draw the same conclusion saying, oh, they recognize their co-specific, so they spend more time with the novelty? Isn't that maybe just a perception bias that they like better what is similar to themselves? I don't know. I will uh, remove uh, uh, one, uh, so the, the throw specific, and I will put the only the con specific. And I will again measure the distance they spend close to, to this, or to the presentation of the sensory cues. And I will try to confirm those results by just presenting the con specific. So I will, I will know whether or not they will spend time, closer uh, time in comparison to fish that will not have any con specific inside, or that have, for example, a non social electric uh, uh, cue or a non social uh, sound. So I will also check into this just by presenting one uh, one type of thing. Other questions? I have one curiosity. Did you explore this social recognition in both sexes or apart? Uh, or not so far. We haven't uh, looked into sex uh, uh, 
differences because they are also very different to sex say uh, the one, one anecdote about this is that our animal housekeeper was trying to reproduce only females inside and the only way to sex them is by sacrificing the fish and this was not uh, our aim our way, aim was more uh, focused on the sensory part of the study but of course it might be interesting and there might be some differences okay one question there Yes? What kind of tactile behavior do they do? So, uh, I don't know about any paper about how they use the, the, the whiskers, but the, 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 at least Sinodontis uh, nigriventis is a nocturnal species, and I think that in a very uh, dark environment, they might use uh, this, uh, this to explore their, their environment. But I, don't, I haven't read about any paper on how they use their whiskers. But that might be an explanation. In a very dark environment, they use them to explore their surroundings. Do you keep the fish together or do you keep them apart? Oh. Like when you're keeping them in their like homes? Yes, they are kept together uh, the different with different conspecifics. So do they ever, like, do we kill them? Do they ever, like, respect the physicists? No, I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that so far. No. But I have seen that they use this when I put them in the, in the, in alone and I give them food, then they try to explore where the food is. So they are like, tit, 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 and they look for it. One last. You said they have like good olfaction. Is there a reason why there is no only olfactory cues, like condition? Uh, because yes, there has been a study in which uh, in European catfish, in which they have done uh, the same experiment I, I did here, but with hiding the, the fish in another tank, and then they have done this uh, circulation of water, and they have tested for a, a social preference just by the presentation of the factory cues. Okay. So I did the opposite here. I would just okay. exclude them, and I will present all the other yeah, sensory models. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Great job. Our last speaker. Okay. Is Gaia De Russi and she will talk about the recognition memory for olfactory stimuli in Daniel Radio. my master thesis that I did uh, in the University of Ferrara, and it's about the recognition memory for olfactory stimuli in the neurario. So I want you to watch this image and try to remember it, and is this one the same one as before? Uh, it's not a trick question, it is, same characteristic, color, shape, but what about this one? If you also say yes, I have bad news for you, but uh, in a very simplistic point of view, uh, the, the resolution for the task I have asked you to resolve is uh, the formation of the memory track for the first stimulus I showed you that is then used by your brain to recognize the second familiar stimulus and also put in contrast with the characteristic, or in this case the zebrafish, so a novel stimulus. And in nature, recognition memory allows animals to discern a novel and familiar stimuli. And this is very important in many different, different contexts. For example, uh, animals need to learn and recognize their flock and the mate's familiar group uh, for uh, decreasing the competition for food resources, but also to recognize unfamiliar partners to increase their genetic variation of, uh, variation of the offspring. Also, animals need to recognize that different species could, that 
could turn out to be a potential predator or to recognize uh, familiar environment and food sources in different contexts. So we still don't know very much about the recognition memory, even if uh, the example I just said, are, we can see that it's very important for the animal fitness. In the literature, we can see one main view that wants uh, uh, a mechanism that uh, have a simple, uh, novelty, familiaristic concept uh, as a continuum, as we can see here. So a stimulus that is considered novel cannot be, by definition, familiar, and vice versa. So uh, this view wants uh, a single mechanism in the brain that uh, encodes and uh, permits to recognize both familiar and novel stimuli. So I'm going to show you another image. What about this one? Is it the same one as before, or is it uh, the second one? In this case, uh, how familiar do you feel? This is the key word, do you feel it is? Uh, the sec in the humans, uh, some research showed that uh, showing uh, uh, some person a first set of image and then ask to put uh, a second set in some different categories uh, following by their, what was their perception, personal perception, or the familiarity or novelty, activating the brain in different areas. With some areas, they were more active, where uh, when the stimulus were perceived as familiar, while, while other areas uh, were more active when the stimulus were perceived uh, as novel, while other areas are uh, active in both cases. In this uh, case, uh, we have an alternative view that also want uh, two different pathways uh, in the brain. So two brain circuits that encode for familiarity and novelty with two different scales. So what we can say about uh, our model? We already met them this morning with another talk, uh, and this is the zebrafish. This animal is a little telos fish that is, uh, took, uh, is uh, expanding all around the world. Also thanks for uh, there is application in different fields and also because uh, he has uh, eye homologies with other vertebrates uh, and also mammals there are the most studied. Other than that, we can say that the brain of the zebrafish is a simple version of the vertebral brain, and so we can use it to study more advanced uh, brains. Uh, zebrafish already show recognition memory for, uh, all uh, for visual cues. Uh, but in some cases, the use of these visual cues is difficult because uh, this animal can decide not to go and uh, watch uh, or explore the visual cues we decided to give them. But also, some new uh, experiment study showed that the zebrafish prefer olfactory cues over visual one when given the possibility. So for our experiment, we decided to use olfactory one with the hope to have a stronger and clearer response to the test. So to do so, we performed two experiments. The first one, we wanted to see, we want to see if, uh, in fact, uh, we can, we can uh, assess the presence of a uh, recognition memory for a factory stimuli in this animal. And uh, in the second experiment, uh, we want to see if we can identify the brain substrate that were involved in this uh, type of memory. Uh, for do this, uh, we borrow some scent that usually, and uh, that usually, uh, used uh, with Murie models, and you know, my case was almond, banana, mint, and almond. So the first experiment, uh, we put the animal in a tank, uh, and, uh, and the animal were presented with two different sponges. One they presented uh, a stimulus, that could be one of the four just said, uh, and the other one was uh, empty as a control. After that, uh, we put the animal in another tank, uh, with the familiar stimulus and a novel one. The, the stimuli were presented in pairs and were distinguished in a easy discrimination, so almond and banana, and in a more difficult one, almond and dimint. The literature about this method told us that if the animal recognized the familiar stimulus, it should be uh, to go to explore the novel one. So what we can see, during the familiarization phase, uh, we can see that the animal, uh, also a nova confirm it, uh, does, doesn't behave in the same way during the length of the test. In fact, uh, our postdoc uh, t-test showed us that during the first half of the test, we cannot see a significant avoidance or exploration of the novel stimulus, 
but uh, during the second half of the test, uh, the animal tend to avoid the stimulus we presented. But during the, uh, during the test phase, we decided to divide it, the two pairs for the analysis, the two olfactory pairs. So for the almond banana pair, so the easy discrimination for them, we can see once again that, oh, that the animal didn't behave in the same way during the old test. So again, in the first half of the test, they didn't care, they didn't show any preference for one of the two sectors. While on the second half of the test, they go uh, and have an active exploration of the novel stimulus. So this uh, can tell us that there is a, a difference uh, in the exploration and there is uh, a recognition memory for the factory stimuli. They remember what they already met. But, and also the fact that both in the familiarization phase and the test phase, uh, we see uh, an effect only in the, half, uh, the second half of the test, uh, tell us that uh, maybe the, the fish need some time to assess the stimulus we give them, or most boring case, uh, that the olfactory cues need some time to diffuse the entirety of the water. For what concerns the difficult discrimination, neither an ANOVA nor a T-test show any uh, effect uh, significant. For the brain and substrate, uh, what we did, other, another test uh, that uh, wanted a familiarization test and a test phase. Like, during the familiarization, all the animals were exposed to the same stimuli, they moved to another tank, and after 30 minutes, exposed to differ two different uh, stimuli, the novel one and the familiar one now. In this case, uh, the novel one uh, was always uh, almond, and the familiar one was always banana. After the test, the animals were sacrificed and the brain were uh, extracted at, uh, and uh, analyzed in different sections. There was uh, the telocephalo, uh, uh, optic tectum, cerebellum, and hypothalamus. Uh, for these uh, areas, uh, we analyzed, uh, we retrotranscribed the RNA to protein for a control gene, APS, and two early genes, CFOSA GR1. And then we, uh, we calculated the relative expression of these two early genes. So what we see in EGR1, in this case, uh, we saw a different expression of the genes in almost all the brain area we analyze. For example, we can see an higher expression of the encephalon in only the animal uh, tested with the familiar stimulus, while in the epithalamus, epithic tectum, we saw a higher expression of this gene in the animal tested with novel stimulus. But what about CFOS? CFOS given, uh, didn't give us uh, any result, and as you can see here, nothing was, um, was significantly different from neither of the, for all the area we tested. In this case, we can say that CFOS maybe isn't as involved as the other gene in the recognition memory for olfactory stimuli, but also maybe our sample was too small to study this gene. So, well, how can I summarize? Zebrafish show one to higher recognition memory for olfactory stimuli, as is happened for visual ones. The similarity between the stimuli affects memory formation. In fact, we saw a recognition for uh, the easy discrimination, but not uh, for the difficult one. And the novel familiar stimuli are processed by clearly separate major brain area. And this uh, go to support the, the second alternative I showed you early, that wants two different uh, brain paths uh, that analyze the familiar and novel stimuli. And thank you for attention. I hope uh, I bored you. <laughs>
to ensure that uh, we had the maximum dispersion possible when we uh, euthanize them. And also, all the tests we're doing in the morning, because uh, it is known that these uh, early genes uh, uh, have a baseline they change during the day, since they, they, they follow a circa, circadian rhythm. And so we tested it all in the morning in two hours, in a two hours uh, window, to ensure that the baseline wasn't too different between uh, all the, the control and tested animals we had. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, very great talk. Um, I have just a curiosity. Um, are there any spontaneous preference for those others? Uh, preference like the animal one? Yeah, yeah, no, the animals are... We chose these uh, others uh, following the literature of the method we use. Uh, but before that, uh, we did some uh, experiment that showed that there isn't a preference because there isn't a point to use order that can be more attractive or less. So. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, if not, thank you for your job. So we can move downstairs for our second poster sessions. I remind you to vote the posters by scanning the QR code. Guys, guys, please, just to be clear, this is the last chance to vote both posters and talks because we need to calculate the score. So we cannot wait till the last moment of the conference. So by the end of the poster session, all the votes that you want to give need to be gave. So please do it. Thank you.